Hello, I'm Pam Davis and a part of Global Philanthropics hashtag Global 20 interview series marking our 20th anniversary. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to interview Lord Simon Woolley, principal of Homerton College, Cambridge about philanthropy's role in society. Lord Woolley is not only a thought leader, but a doer. Early on, he engaged in politics, joining the campaign group Charter 88 to research the potential impact of the black vote. The findings encouraged him to launch Operation Black Vote in 1996. Esme Fairburn Foundation estimated that your efforts in this area had encouraged millions of people to vote. Lord Woolley has also worked with the Open Source Foundation on their global drugs policy projects, securing 90 million in funding to encourage disadvantaged young people to work. He has served as a commissioner on the Equality of Human Rights Commission and was one of the architects of the UK's Race Disparity Unit. In October of 2021, Lord Woolley was elected principal of Homerton College, Cambridge. Welcome, Lord Woolley. Can you share with us a little bit about your philanthropic journey and what philanthropy has meant to you? Well, I've been an activist for nearly 30 years. I see myself, Pam, as, a, as a, in many ways, a disciple of Dr. Martin Luther King, who had more than a dream, he had a plan, a plan to tackle uh, racial and social injustice. And for many years, we worked as volunteers. We had no money and no money anytime soon. And it wasn't until philanthropists, uh, organizations and individuals that uh, lent the, their support, including financial support, that in a way we were able to turbocharge our dream and our passion for, for, for justice. What is interesting, that those uh, philanthropists, those organizations, in, in, in our case in the UK, particularly the Quakers, uh, with, with their social justice mission, um, they were able to empower us. So their philosophy was, we don't know, you know. Uh, we will empower you to do what you need to do. So it was never a diktat. Mm. Uh, we were never told, well, we've got this vision and we'd like you to, to get on board. It was, we need to empower you because the the genesis and the driver starts with you doing what you need to do. That's an early and very enlightened view, mm. which I think um, a lot of philanthropy has only just caught up with in the past few years. So that's really good to hear. Mm. I wonder if we could explore this a little bit more. I, I came across um, the uh, Operation Black Vote report in 2017 that was called The Color of Power which looked at the racial makeup of the UK's top uh, jobs across 28 sectors. And if we, we changed that slightly and we undertook a similar exercise and we called it the color of philanthropy, what would we find? We would be shocked to see the billionaires and millionaires in the philanthropic space who predominantly uh, I wouldn't say exclusively, but near exclusively, uh, don't look like me. And moreover, don't have the lived experience of someone like me or you know, black and brown. Now, why does that matter? Well, I think as you suggested beforehand, unless you have extremely enlightened philanthropists, uh, they cannot bring their passion and vision uh, to, this, to this space because they're always looking at it through a different lens. So it might be well-meaning, but actually uh, it might do more harm than good. So you, you, you need representation, you need lived experiences at the top of these spaces to be able to better articulate uh, what's, what's needed. If I may say, I do remember speaking to um, George Soros at his, at his home in, in New York. And he asked me what the problem is. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, with all due respect, mm -hmm. sir, the problem might be you, uh, uh, it, unless it, you can empower others like me to be in those decision-making tables. And to be fair to him and his, his son, Alex, 
He said, I agree. I agree that it can't be me speaking for you. You must speak for yourselves. And it's a, it's a big moment for me when, when um, those type of people get that uh, uh, and, make, and make the change to ensure greater representation. That's a really good point. It, it made me wonder, how do we encourage people who may not have that perspective yet? Mm. How do we encourage them to see not the benefit for them? Because frankly, people often start with that. How is that going to help me? So how right. do we help people see the benefit for them of that's, more diversity? I think, I think the, 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 you know, those in that space who have a lot of money um, and are well-meaning, have you know that, you yeah. You've dealt and had dinners uh, with a lot of these people. Uh, and often many of them have gotten where they were through being, excuse my language, bloody minded. Um, and uh, not, not Machiavellian, but um, how can I put entrepreneurial and, and you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but what too often what some lack is humility. And it's the humility piece that says, I don't know, but I think you do, uh, is a game changer. Because it's in that space where you say, look, I can help, but I want you to do. Um, I like those conversations. I've had them in big government. I've had them with philanthropists. And when you marry those two, humility, um, support, uh, driven, impatience for change <laughs> I think good things can happen have you found um, people being more willing in the past couple of years to be a bit more um, humble and to yes. listen a little bit more and why has that happened I think the the murder of George Floyd <laughs> and the conversation that it spawned for the first time in my lifetime did I hear um, philanthropists, CEOs in business and education institutions, um, be open to listen more to the lived experiences of people that didn't look like them. Before and they'd say, yes, but, or aren't we all the same? Or isn't, isn't it your problem? But this time, for some reason, they, kind of took a step back and said, I believe you. I mean, to me, it's a bit shocking why it took so long, but- It is shocking. Uh, nevertheless, when people say, I believe you, and uh, what can, not what can I do, but what can we do, then you start putting into place the, the great support and interventions that will have the transformative effect. Because you have been involved in politics for so many years, um, both as an activist and um, uh, in government, mm -hmm. um, are the conversations changing? Do you see those changing? I, I think sometimes as a citizen, uh, and I'm a dual citizen, yep. we don't always hear our politicians saying the things that we wish that they would be saying. and 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 maybe it would be interesting if you could kind of help us understand, are those conversations taking place? Are there changes afoot? What can we uh, do, I guess, as voters? Sure. Um, well, I think voters is important because um, that, that, that politicians need our vote. And this is why I've you know, been involved in Operation Black Vote to, to move the dial through the electoral process. In, in regards to the politicians, it ebbs and flows. Uh, this present government a little bit like the Donald Trump government uh, has been in full square denial of structural race inequality, for example, and many other areas. Deny, 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 deny. Gaslight uh, to tell people that, that they don't have a problem, they're the problem. And uh, um, that's where we are with this present government, I'm afraid, uh, in no small measure. And um, what, what then tends to happen is, is that while society, the, will be ready for change. If government is in denial and full square against it, um, you lose that opportunity. Um, you know, so that's the first thing. But, but the bigger picture is, I think that if citizens, voters, 
good people stand up and be counted and saying that we want these uncomfortable conversations. We want to learn from it. This is not a I win, you lose power. It's I win, we all win. And I think there'll be a parallel, there'll be a parallel universe, if you like. One, the deniers, mm -hmm. and then the other, the rest of society. And I think the rest of the society will be much bigger and then government will have to follow suit because it, th this track unleashes talent, one. Two, it allows people to better live together. There's not the blame game. I'm poor because I'm taking the knee, as some would articulate it, pitting mm -hmm. poor white people against poor black people. No, we together, uh, we can solve this problem. It's not a zero sum game. And above all, we unleash talent. Thank you so much. One of the things that um, struck me as you were talking about that, Simon, is that oftentimes philanthropists want to fund something um, that isn't around policy or politics. And yet uh, we've had other speakers and, and yourself who are emphasizing the importance of supporting these groups. Mm. If I were a philanthropist, I, I wish I, I had the kind of money that uh, some of them do. If I were a philanthropist and I said, Simon, tell me why I should support some of these grassroots roots organizations. What's gonna be different? How would you help right. me to understand well, that? I, I would say that real change has to be bottom up and you have to empower those citizens, particularly those citizens that are most affected by inequality <laughs> uh, of injustice, mm -hmm. they can best articulate the challenge and what they need if they're supported. It's really no good that somebody high above said, I know what's good for you. Because how would you? You can say, I want to support someone like you, but you, they cannot know. So on the bottom up approach, and then linked in with allies, that linked in with people who, are, who have a Rolodex of powerful people. Mm -hmm. You know, why don't you speak to so-and-so? He's got some great ideas. And then opening that doors. And then saying, being around the table too. You know, if you have, if you have one million pounds and then you call 10 other people that have a million pounds, that you've just got a catalytic converter that is the driver for great change. And uh, I think that, that that is driven by humility, is driven by a sense of purpose, but it's driven by also um, a, uh, a passion, a passion to, to, to want to see change, not in, not in 10 years time or even five years time, but next month and next year. And, and the building, the building of that change is extremely empowering and humbling because it means every day you wake up as a, as a philanthropist saying, I'm helping change in the world. That's very true. We've talked a little bit about um, the color of philanthropy and I, and I just, I think it would be good to pause here again and say, why does that matter? Um, or is it perhaps the recognition and inclusion of a wider group of donors uh, as a means to push equity in society. And why does that matter now more than ever? Mm. I, I think, I think um, inclusion and representative philanthropists, givers, supporters, um, does one of two things. One, it allows you to make better decisions. Yes. Because you've got that team in diversity that, that comes from different perspectives. Two, and almost equally important, it's about uh, illustrating uh, where power is, mm -hmm. where it lies, who is to be listened to. So if, for example, you just have a group of white people saying, this is how we're gonna change the world. And you have black and brown people looking at that thinking, hmm, how's that relate to me? Mm. Is that what power looks like? Is that what philanthropy looks like? You know, some of the greatest philanthropists in the world are those that have little or nothing. 
because they're constantly giving. And there's no pat on the back uh, or, or any recognition. So we know how to give mm -hmm. with nothing. Imagine how we can give with something. That's an extraordinary thought. As we look at the future, and, and clearly we're faced with, you and I spoke before the interview about some of the very, very difficult challenges ahead of us. What role do you think philanthropy can play? And you know, if you were in charge of the whole shebang, where would you ask people to, to start? Mm. I would ask people to start by listening. I would ask people to start by opening up their heart. I would ask people to convene like-minded people in different areas and say that how do we, how can we make a catalytic converter? How can we accumulate what we've got to drive the greatest change? Uh, we, I think particularly for, for philanthropists, Pam, um, they have a special place in this planet, really. You think about it, mm -hmm. because there's very few people that can truly be the change makers that philanthropists can be. I'm an activist. I can campaign. I can go with my placards and da 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 da. But but philanthropists can say, I'm not only going to talk. I'm going to fantastically do. Uh, so it's a it's a special role. That, that I don't want philanthropists to be burdened by it, but enlightened by it, not be, be, headed, be big headed by it, mm -hmm. but be humbled, have the humility um, to say, this is really not about me. Uh, you know, I'm fine, but about what I as a human being can do that's what that's the conversation I want with philanthropists. Oh, and by the way, Pam, they're welcome to come here. I'm happy to <laughs> I'm happy to come, Vina. You can chair, Pam, because that's what you do. You chair. I'll point the finger and uh, and we we can hopefully sew a golden thread. What about that? That would be very exciting. I think you've written a wonderful new uh, or or improved the role description of an enlightened philanthropist and the kinds of philanthropy that we need today. Uh, Lord Simon Woolley, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it.